We have children, Sunday school today. And so children, if you want to go and have fun in your class, you're welcome to join Pastor Michelle. Or you can stay here with us as well. You're invited to stay. We have, there you go, we have been talking about Micah uh, since last Sunday. This is not a very popular book because it talks a lot about how much the people of God have sinned and the destruction that comes because of their sin. But it, there's also hope in the midst of this book because despite all the times that Israel has failed, God continues to show up. God does not run away from his people who fail time after time. He doesn't hide from them. He doesn't shun them, but he disciplines them in order that they would hopefully return to God. And today we talk about chapter 2, committing to goodness. In our world, in our society, we have entities or organizations that exist to protect, to serve and to do good. Do you know any? An example? The food pantry, okay. A church, hopefully, <laughs> right? What else? Salvation Army, okay. How about doctors? Yeah, okay. Doctors, okay, let's stick with that. Now, each of these entities, for example, doctors, they go through a process that's very rigorous in training and education to ensure that they are doing more good than harm, right? We want to make sure that they know what they're doing. The last thing you want to hear from your surgeon as he's opening up your heart is, oh, which one is the aorta? <laughs> like, you, you don't want that, right? You hopefully want that person to know what they are doing. As a reminder, though, of their commitment to do good, doctors come together under this covenant called the Hippocratic Oath. You've heard of it, right? It's written to remind doctors to continue to uphold and develop the art of medicine. But furthermore, it seeks to protect the relationship between the doctor and the patient by promising to have no evil intentions, but to act justly and respect the patient at all times. Doctors are not the only ones who swear or who make an oath for such commitment. You have law enforcement who take an oath and they commit to do what? To protect. You also have judges who take an oath and who take a commitment to act justly and to act uh, fairly and so on. And it's this common commitment that brings these groups together. And the greater the number, the stronger people feel empowered to their commitment. Imagine we as Christians who have values and have commitments. If you were the only one committed to saying lying is not okay, or stealing from the poor is not okay, but everyone else around you thinks, no, it is okay, would it be easy for you to stand? How long would it take before you also become one of them? There's power in number. We come together under God's covenant to do good, to stay committed to God, to uphold His truth, reflect His love, and follow His kingdom values. It's easier when we're all in it. It's hard when only a few partake of it. It's in community then, when we all participate, that our commitment to God matures and is embodied. It's hard when those commitments are not spoken and they're not shared and they're not lived out together. And often that's where the downfall begins when we forget our commitments, when we forget what we're here for, and each one chooses their own values and their own ways of life. And soon the divisions come, and soon people begin 
to find their own ways and make their own ways. Israel had forgotten their commitment to God. They had forgotten why they were there in the first place. Some committed their lives to other things besides God, and it created more harm than good. Clearly, God told them before entering the promised land, there are two things that you can choose from. You can choose to live good, and good will come to you, or you can choose to do evil, and curses will come to you. And God hopes that his children will choose good. But not everyone did. Micah 2, verse 1 and 2 begins like this. It says, Doom to those who devise wickedness, to those who plan evil when they are in bed. By the light of morning they do it, for they are very powerful. They covet fields and seize them, houses and take them away. They oppress a householder and those in his house, a man and his estate. Very harsh beginning, right? And very harsh words. And this is not talking about those outside of Israel. This is talking about people within Israel, God's own people. They increase their riches at the expense of the vulnerable, of the poor. They take advantage of others to increase their own wealth. And every night, continue to scheme more ways to take more fields. Their power is not used to empower others to do good. Rather, their power is used to get away with wickedness and injustice. Their wickedness has a name, and it's called covet. They commit to covet. It's not even accidental. It's premeditated. They go to bed thinking all night, scheming new ways of how can I covet more? How can I acquire more? How can I take that which does not belong to me? And what's worse is they feel invincible. Because they are so powerful, because no one can stand against them, they think they can continue for as long as they can until God speaks, until God says it's enough. And God, of course, commanded through Moses. They have a warning. In Exodus 20, 17, very clearly, it tells us, right? Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's house. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Do not covet. Because jealousy overpowers the heart as you focus on what you don't have. How many of you have fallen in that trap, right? I wish I had that. If only I could have that. And we scheme and we think and we think ways of how we can attain it. It consumes you as you desperately seek to take what is not yours. And it lies to you and fools you by saying, if you simply have it, you would be satisfied and happy. Only to realize how quickly another lie begins to sprout. Hmm. That wasn't enough. I think you need more. And so, covet has a never-ending cycle. Micah says these people will be mocked, as all they have accumulated will be distributed amongst the conquering Assyrian Empire. All these things that you took from the poor, that you amassed, that you coveted for, one day you will cry, because what you have acquired, others will come and distribute among themselves. Micah 2, 4, it says, On that day, a taunt will be raised against you. Someone will wail bitterly. We are utterly destroyed. He exchanges the portions of my people. He removes what belongs to me. He gives away our fields to a rebel. There is nothing holy or whole in covetousness. In 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, I think you know the story of King David and uh, Bathsheba. King David was looking out <clears throat> from the, his rooftop. He saw a woman who was bathing, and he saw that she was pretty. And he had the power to call her and to bring her into his palace. Bathsheba, unfortunately, was, Bathsheba was married to Uriah. 
after she found out she was pregnant from King David, King David went and made a plan to make sure that Uriah would die in battle. And this is a short version. This is the PG-13 <laughs> version, right? But later, just when David thought that he had gone away with it, God sends a prophet named Nathan to tell him this story. In 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 10, I want you to pay attention to the story. <clears throat> it says, so the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan came to him and said, there were two men in a certain city. One was rich and the other was poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cows, but the poor man had only one little female lamb that he had bought. He raised her and she grew up in his home with his children. She would eat his food and drink from his cup. She rested in his arms and was like a daughter. Now, a visitor came to the rich man. The rich man thought it would be a pity to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler. So, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared her for the traveler. David, burned with anger against the man, said, I solemnly swear, as the Lord lives, he said to Nathan, the man who did this certainly deserves to die, and he must pay back four times the price of the lamb because he did this and had no pity. Nathan says, you are the man, Nathan told David. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and rescued you from Saul. I gave you your master Saul's house and his wife. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this weren't enough, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise my word by doing what I considered evil? You had Uriah the Hittite killed in battle. You took his wife as your wife. You used the Ammonites to kill him. So warfare will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. It's harsh, right? But this is a king who took an oath before God to serve God's people. A king anointed by God to lead with God a nation that would be a blessing to other nations. We know that at the end, King David did turn away, did repent, and we read that psalm in Psalm 51. And the reason why at the end it says King David was a man after God's own heart is because true repentance teaches us that we don't go back and do the same thing again. We don't hear a story of King David doing the same thing again and again and again. Once was enough. He learned his lesson. That was it. We're not turning there again. It wasn't, though, just one night, however, that King David sat on his bed and thought, how can I hide my sin? I assure you, it was many nights where he thought, what would be the best way for me to cover up my sin? He even tried to bring Uriah from battle to sleep with his wife and to make sure, right, that the child would be his child. But he was so faithful and loyal to his country and to his soldiers that he didn't even spend the night with his wife. He slept outside his house. Plan failed, right? So once again, sleeps at night, scheming and thinking, how can I hide my sin? You think you can hide your sins before others, but we cannot hide our sins from God. And Amos is, and, and Micah and all the prophets point that out time after time. We cannot hide our evil hearts from God. Just as David despised God's word and did what was considered evil that time, God's people are once again found reluctant to listen to God's truth. And they tell Micah, the prophet, hey Micah, why don't you just stay in your lane? <laughs> why don't you just stay in your lane? And it's easy, right? Because for us, we're not accustomed and we're not used to people preaching about sin and preaching about how we should turn from sin and people how we should change our lives, right? These are not the kind of sermons that often people want to come and hear. They want to come and listen to how we can be blessed. How can we have more? How can we do this? How can we have a better life? Yes, but we cannot get there unless we address that which is hindering us from the good life that God wants for us. And it's the sin. 
And they tell Micah, stop telling us these things. We don't want to hear it. In Micah 2, 6-9, it says, they mustn't preach. So they preach. They mustn't preach of such things. And they tell themselves, disgrace won't overtake us. What arrogance, right? Should this be said, house of Jacob? Is the Lord's patience cut short? Are these his deeds? Don't my words help the one who behaves righteously? But yesterday, my people, the Lord rose up as an enemy. You strip off the glorious clothes from trusting passerby, those who reject war. You drive out the women of my people, each from their cherished house, from their young children. You take away my splendor forever. Micah finally gets down to the details. Him and his people are like the man in Nathan's story who had one little sheep. And they are being robbed and abused left and right. Telling them your desires have become your God. Your covetousness has become your master. Your greed has made you blind. They think they are unstoppable because God, who is a promise keeper, who has promised to make Israel a great nation, who has promised his loving faithfulness, would never let Israel go through that, right? But the promise was never at the expense of wickedness and sin, but through a people that worship God and committed to follow God. To those who are still committed to God and faithful to God, a word of hope comes from God as they wait upon the Lord. God is not one who burns bridges. God keeps that bridge open because there are those who know who God is and will remain faithful to God. And so he keeps his promise alive in Micah 2, 12 through 13 and reminds who our God is. And it says, I'll surely gather Jacob, all of you. I'll surely assemble you, those who are left of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in Basra, like a flock in its pen, noisy with people. The one who breaks out will go before them. They will break out and pass through the gate. They will leave by it. They will pass on their king before them and the Lord at their head. And God surely kept his promises and continues to keep his promises. Not all of Israel wandered away from God. Not all of Israel turned away from God. Not all of Israel were reluctant to obey to God. Many stayed committed. Many repented. Many were ready to welcome Jesus. Jesus goes out to gather his sheep and lead his sheep once and for all. No longer abandoned, but to be shepherded by the good shepherd. One who will not succumb to sin, but overcome it, that we too would overcome it. Jesus, who now leads us and calls us to worship him in spirit and truth, did not bring us into this kingdom to perpetuate the covetousness in our hearts that once ruled and enslaved us. Jesus invites us into a kingdom that we may commit to goodness. To goodness. Easton's Bible Dictionary defines goodness by saying this. It says, goodness in man is not a mere passive quality, but the deliberate preference of right to wrong, the firm and persistent resistance of all moral evil, and the choosing and following of all moral good. God calls us to this kind of goodness, committed to this. When we commit to goodness, we commit to godliness. We commit to righteousness. We commit to holiness. And all these things point to God. And all these things are defined by God. And I pray that we be not so blinded from our commitment to God as did with Israel. But instead, I pray that our commitment to goodness will lead us to the cross and put to death our sins. I pray that our commitment will humble us enough, our commitment to goodness will humble us enough to ask God, God, show us, show me, where have I failed you? Where are we practicing injustice? 
Where are we hurting others? Where am I hurting myself? Where am I hurting my family? That I may turn away from it. May our commitment to goodness lead us to a God and not back to our old habits. But I pray our commitment to goodness will lead us to God's words all the time. Where we find what is right, where we find what is good, where we find what is holy. We are a people committed to goodness. And I pray that we would live it out. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for reminding us of why you have called us as people, Lord God. We have a role. We have a place in your kingdom. And there are certain rules and values in your kingdom. There are certain principles in your kingdom. There's a certain lifestyle in your kingdom. There's goodness in your kingdom. There's joy in your kingdom. There's salvation in your kingdom. There's forgiveness in your kingdom. There's acceptance in your kingdom. Lord God, I pray that our lives would enhance the kingdom of God as we are committed to goodness. I pray that you would help us to build up the kingdom of God as we are committed to you. And I pray, Lord God, that we would not be so blind to our sins that we turn away from your kingdom, that we bring a bad name to your kingdom. But I pray that you would give us a sensitivity, Lord God, that when a prophet comes and speaks up against our sins, that we would not mock them or ridicule them or ignore them, but to be humble and listen and say, God, forgive me. And I pray that we would commit to living the life that you want us to live. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.